afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the October Colloquium. Um, we're really excited today to have Dr. Donna Jamzak um, be our colloquium speaker. Um, this particular series is called the Communication Research Colloquium Series, sponsored by the Communication Research Center and the College of Communication. Um, we are extremely excited to have Dr. Yamebeck share her research today, and her research interests include global terrorism and new media, and immigrant and refugee representations. Dr. Yamebeck is a ma uh, master lecturer in the Department of Mass Communication, Advertising, and Public Relations here at Boston University, and please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Dana. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you, Susie Blair, for organizing the event. Um, thank you, Professors uh, Tsai Fogel and Cummings for inviting me to speak. Um, I absolutely love the opportunity to share my research with the BU community. And I'm also thankful to all of you, students, faculty, and staff who showed up today uh, during a busy time um, of the semester. So I'm going to start my um, talk with you today by asking you to do this um, horrible exercise that I do with my students when I lecture on this topic. So the first thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to close your eyes for a few seconds. Don't worry, I'm not hypnotizing you. <laughs> and what I want you to think about is, assume that a war just broke out in your town, and you need to escape, you need to run out very quickly, um, you need to leave your home, your dorm room, wherever you live, and you want to, you only have a few seconds to pack whatever it is that you're going to pack. So take a few seconds to pack your things and open your eyes when you're done packing. Okay, so what did you pack? Cats. Your cats? Okay, your animals, excellent. <laughs> your what, sorry? My dog. Your dogs, yes, cats and dogs. You guys haven't been in war, have you? It's not what you pack in wartime. What about the rest of you? Anyone from this side, what did you pack? I thought about beer, but it was too heavy, so I went with uh, some clothes and some photographs. Clothes and photographs, very good. So memories for the future. Were you going to add something? Yeah, I was. Photographs, okay, excellent. And where are those photographs? In what format are they? Are they printed? Okay, all right. Anyone else? Michael, what did you pack? I packed money, ID, and essentially uh, any kind of communication devices I have. Any kind of communication devices you have. Okay, excellent. Um, anyone pack their cell phone? Yeah. Okay, many of you. Did you remember your phone charger? Yeah. One of you did. Uh, did you pack um, SIM cards? If you, I don't know if you own multiple SIM cards, but if you did, that may have been something you packed. You talked about multiple communication devices. Um, did you pack your radio? Anyone has a radio speed? radio um, device? No. Did you pack your TV? No, no one packed it. Oh. All right, so this leads me to um, today's talk. Um, as you may recall, our topic today is refugees, cell phones, and information precarity. So really what I'm going to talk to you today um, is the intersection of information and cell phones, how these two uh, topics and these two fields intersect. I'll give you a quick outline. We will start by talking about um, what the world refugee um, status looks like, just to provide context for our talk today. I'm going to talk to you specifically about Syrian refugees and um, what state they are in um, today. Then I will jump into the actual research, which is um, the refugee conditions. What conditions do refugees live in, in urban areas and in camps? And then we'll talk about the use, the role of information and communication technologies, specifically cell phones, um, in the refugee crisis. I mention, of course, the refugee conditions because the conditions inform how ICTs are being used. I also want to point out that even though the Syrian refugee crisis is ongoing, um, it has been ongoing since 2011, um, it may have not received a lot of media attention recently. Nevertheless, the lessons that we learned from the Syrian refugee crisis in terms of the um, use of communication technologies 
are lessons that hopefully are applicable to other refugee crises um, around the world. So this area of research is actually relatively new to me. I started this area of research in 2013. Before that, my, I had a very different area of research, but um, ironically, these two areas of research, which is refugees and terrorism, came into focus the last few years um, because of politician rhetoric specifically politicians' anti-refugee and anti-immigrant um, rhetoric. But that's kind of a story for a different day. So this is um, a publication with my colleague Philip Seed, uh, Philip Seed from um, USC, who, um, this is, it's not the first book that looks at terrorism and the internet, but it's one of the first publications that tried to bring those two fields together to see how um, terrorists use um, the internet to communicate their messages. But again, that's a very different topic than what we're talking about today. So let's get started with the general overview. So if you look at um, UNHCR number, UNHCR is the international organization mandated with protecting refugees. This is what the overall world status of refugees looks like. So the number you may hear of often in the news is 70 million. 70 million refers to all the displaced people around the world. 41 million of that number are people who are internally displaced. So those are people displaced within their own country. 20, almost 26 million people are what is technically referred to as refugees. Uh, people who fled war conditions and persecution and violence and three million are considered asylum seekers. The difference between the last two terms, um, technically refugees are asylum seekers. They seek asylum before they're granted refugee status. Um, yet, in literature, sometimes we combine these two categories of people because again, they're categories of people who are fleeing war for um, very similar reasons. So my research specifically looks at Syrian refugees in Jordan um, and in Germany. And I will mention that the Syrian refugee crisis has been the biggest contributor to that 26 million um, number. This is a map of the Middle East. When the Syrian, so the Syrian crisis, the Syrian war started in March 2011, so we're technically in the ninth year of the war. When the war first started, the population of Syria was 21 million people. Approximately half of that population has been displaced. Half of the country's population has been displaced. Um, so it's really hard to put into words the magnitude of the, of the crisis. So about 6 million people are displaced internally, and 6 million people have fled the country. And those who fled the country, they fled to those neighboring countries. Turkey today is host to the largest refugee population in the world, with 3.6 million. In um, Lebanon, we have 900,000 Syrian refugees. And in Jordan, which is what I'm focusing on, we have 650,000 uh, Syrian refugees. The situation in Syria is, of course, quite, um, quite horrible that refugees have, um, Syrians have sought refuge in countries like Iraq and countries like Egypt that have their own political um, instabilities. So to put the number in perspective, the 650,000 in Jordan, to put that number in perspective, this would be the equivalent of all of Canada moving into the United States. So all of Canada, about 37 million Canadians, moved into the United States tomorrow, a nation of 300 plus million people. It would raise the percentage of the population in the US by about 10%. So that's what happened in Jordan. The population was raised by about 10% when Syrians moved to Jordan. So I want you to think for a minute about um, what impact that would have on a country in terms of its um, 
impact on the healthcare system, the schooling system, um, access to water, access to food, and perhaps most importantly, employment, access to um, jobs. So today I'll focus my research again on Jordan, uh, which also happens to be the country where I was uh, born and raised. I lived there the first um, 17 years of my life before I came to the United States. I'll mention my research in Germany briefly, but I'm more than happy to answer questions about um, the situation in Germany as well. So before I move forward, I want to mention my two co-researchers co who I did most of my research trips with. So this is from one of our uh, many visits to Jordan. On the left is Dr. Melissa Wall, who is with California State University in Northridge, um, and who is a journalism professor. And on the right is Professor uh, Madeline Otis Campbell, who is at Worcester State University um, and is an urban uh, studies professor and also an associate dean uh, of academic affairs. The nature of refugee studies is interdisciplinary, so we've all benefited from our different uh, perspectives, and certainly we've benefited from Dr. Otis Campbell's urban studies uh, perspective on the, on the refugee crisis. I'll mention briefly to you the methods, just to, again, um, kind of put context to the research. So we went to, uh, we did four research trips in Jordan and one research trip uh, to Germany. I've also gone to Germany on a different project related um, to Syrian refugees. We did interviews and focus groups. And the interviews and focus groups were with different categories of people. Um, most of them were with refugees themselves. But we also met with UNHCR professionals, NGOs. There are dozens of NGOs in any country. Uh, if not hundreds, that work with refugees. We've also interviewed government officials to try and get a 360 degree um, look on the refugee crisis. Interviews lasted anywhere from 30 to 90 minutes. They were conducted in either Arabic or English or both, depending on the participants. Um, I speak Arabic, so that obviously helped facilitate uh, those interviews. And they took places in anywhere from caravans to tents to tents, to um, office buildings, um, again, depending on who we were interviewing. And the main research question we were trying to answer is this. In what ways were refugees' use of and access to personal and public information precarious, and how did they respond? So in other words, what was, if you were to look at refugees' access to information, what did that look like? Did they have stable access to information? And we know from our research that they didn't, so how did they respond to that uh, precarity? So this is the communication question we asked. To answer this communication question, we had to look at um, their living conditions. We know from the communication field that the use of, um, really the use of technologies are situated in people's realities and people's living conditions. So you can't separate these two from each other. So again, to answer this communication question, we asked a lot of questions that are about the living conditions of, of refugees. So I'll talk to you about these living conditions. So if I were to ask you, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of refugees in terms of an image? What's the first image that comes to mind? Tents. Tents. Excellent. I was hoping you would say that. Tents. I was the right answer. Tents. Absolutely. So most of us think of um, really camps, refugee camps and tents when we think of refugees. And there's a percentage of refugees that live in, um, in camps. But in fact, um, and camps is where whenever you have celebrities visiting refugees, they usually visit, uh, visit them in camps. So again, the images that we usually consume about refugees usually are set in camps. And uh, certainly refugees do live in camps. But the most, the, 
More than 50% of refugees around the world actually live in urban areas. And I'll walk you through why that may be the case in a minute. So, but first let's talk about what camp conditions look like. Um, and I will mention the pictures in the presentation are from our different research trips. If um, there are pictures of refugees, I will show you, so please don't replicate those pictures um, you know, with your own devices. So in camp, most refugees, when they move to a country, they start by living in a refugee camp, if there are camps, in fact, in those countries. The biggest advantage of living in a camp is that you don't pay rent. You're not paying rent for your tent, you're not paying rent for your um, caravan. In camp settings, usually these are enclosed settings, depending on the country. This is from um, Zachary Camp, which was the largest camp in Jordan at the time. Um, at its peak, it hosted around 150,000 refugees. So in many ways, it was its own small city. So again, the biggest advantage is you don't pay rent. You have somewhat quick access to UNHCR and the dozens of nonprofits that work there. The camp is a um, few miles, so you can walk, theoretically you can walk um, the camp if you are in good health. And you're living within your Syrian community, so you're not living among strangers per se. Yet the biggest, biggest challenge of living in a camp is that there are almost no jobs. So you're not paying rent, but you don't have access to employment. The living conditions obviously are difficult. If you're living in a tent and it's very hot in the summer, it's very cold in the winter, you can imagine um, that that will be problematic. Usually families of multi-generations, they're sharing one, um, they're all sleeping in the exact same um, tent. The um, camps are crowded, there's limited access to hospitals, certainly limited access to um, opportunities. And because you're cut off from the rest of the world, you really have limited access to information as well, which is a theme that's emerged over and over and over again in our research. And you don't have a clear sense of how you can gain access to information. And just as a side note, camps are, again, they're usually enclosed spaces that you cannot leave unless you have a permit to leave the camps. And that's kind of a whole other story. How do you get a permit? Um, and if you were able to leave, again, what would you, what would you do? So these are some images from um, some of the camps we visited. This is a um, falafel restaurant. Um, so this is kind of a rare case of someone having a job, right? Because they are running this restaurant. This is an image of a man creating a job for himself. He's about to open a shop. Um, again, very, very few examples of that. This is a fruit market where you can obviously buy vegetables and fruits. This is a um, place that sells television sets and washing machines. And I will mention there is illegal access to electricity in a lot of these camps. So you don't have an official line to your tent, but you can, you know, with some electrical electrician skills, you can draw a line from the main uh, grid. This is a mosque in the camp. And this is a computer lab, although it doesn't have um, internet. So this is just a lab where you can play video games kind of to pass time. So really, these camps have developed into small cities, and if, if you can find this thing, if you can find something in a real city, you can find it, and chances are you'll be able to find it in the camp. Um, so I know my colleagues mentioned that you will pack your cats and your dog. There are pet shops in some of these um, camps. Uh, there are hair salons, there are places that sell wedding dresses, baby clothes, um, you name it. And that's an all an indication of how life goes on, life continues in the camp, even though you're a refugee and many aspects of your life has been put on hold, such as your education, your employment, all that has been put on hold. But other aspects of your life does, uh, 
do continue. Yet again, um, camps, as I mentioned, are crowded. They are, you know, certainly not super clean. This is an example of a communal kitchen in one of the camps. So this is what you would be sharing with your um, many, many neighbors. Um, the conditions, again, are not um, hygienic. Certainly the toilet situation is very difficult because you're sharing toilets with thousands of uh, strangers. Sometimes what people end up doing in camps is um, in their own tent or caravan, they would create their own toilet. Um, so you can imagine how that would lead to many health um, problems. I don't have pictures of the communal bathrooms, but you can use your imagination. So hopefully you can imagine why someone would want to leave the camp and seek out better opportunities for themselves and their families. Um, hopefully you can imagine that if you were put in that situation, that you would probably make the choice to relocate um, your family. So if you do relocate and you figure out either a legal way to leave the camp or an illegal way to pay a smuggler to escape the camp, you will end up in housing similar to this. So this is kind of a stereotypical building in Jordan, of, of course housing that's not um, luxurious. Uh, this is in the outskirts of the city of Amman, the capital. If you were to compare living conditions in camps and in urban areas, the biggest advantage you have in urban areas is that you have access to potential employment. Again, think about it. Without a job, there are so many things you can't afford. Without a job, you can't afford um, to purchase things for your children. You can't afford to save money for the future. So the biggest advantage of living in urban areas is um, access to opportunities and access to jobs. You also have the potential of integrating into that society because now you're mingling with locals. You have freedom of movement. Um, so you might have self-restricted movement because you don't want to maybe interact with too many people. Uh, you certainly don't want to interact with the police, but you do have freedom of movement in um, urban areas. Yet the challenge is you're trying to find a job and compete with um, the thousands of people who are looking for employment. So if you end up in a country like Jordan, you, where the unemployment rate this year is 19%, you're trying to find jobs and competing with locals um, for these jobs. As we know from examples in our own country, when people are seeking out employment illegally, they may be taken advantage of by employers. Um, and I will clarify that there are the laws regarding employment fluctuate. Technically, you're supposed to get a permit to work. Permits are expensive. It's hard to get a permit if you don't have a job to begin with. So you might seek out employment without a permit. If you do that, you risk being deported. And, and the cycle continues. And again, if you live in urban areas similar to camps, you also have a huge challenge of identifying finding out information that's relevant for you as a newcomer to that country. This is what some of the insides of these apartments look like. Obviously very humble um, settings. This is one of the families that we met with. Uh, Multi-generations live in the same household. Um, yet again, because they're not well connected socially, um, an emerging theme has always been, in both settings, camp and urban areas, is finding uh, relevant information. People who live in urban areas tend to move a lot because rent might increase, they might end up you know, in really bad neighborhoods, um, so they tend to move multiple times. And as they move, again, it becomes hard to connect to services within their own um, community. So it's this Migration experience that makes it very difficult for them to access stable information. So let's talk for a minute about literature on the topic of information. So the literature on information and refugees identifies 
that refugees find in some information to be most useful, and that information has to do with their um, ability to reach their destinations and what they can do once, once they reach that destination. So information about how can I get to this point, how can I leave Syria and get to this point, and information about what services are available to me once I reach that point. Literature identifies an information gap um, where the information that's available to refugees does not always meet their information needs. And literature also basically points out that the burden is on the refugees themselves to develop new information practices, to seek out information that will match their own information needs, since that information is not available uh, to them. So these are some of the scholars that have studied this topic. So to accurately capture what the refugees we met experienced in terms of information, um, my colleagues and I coined the term information precarity. And I'll give you a minute to read the, the way we defined it. So we know from our research that refugees don't have stable access to information, and that lack of stable access may put their lives at risk, depending on the, on the context. The concept of precarity originally came from Judith Butler, um, who conceptualized it as an ongoing um, unpredictability and insecurity, a state of ongoing unpredictability and insecurity. And usually that concept was applied to, um, applied to the economic field to refer to people having economic precarity. But we've applied this concept to the information field. So going back to the research question of how refugees experience precarity and how they respond to it, this is where the, um, the role of cell phones becomes important. So we know that refugees experience precarious information precarity, whether they live in urban or areas or in camps. We know that they try to respond by using their phones. Every family we met with owned a cell phone. Every single family we met with owned a cell phone, despite having very, very harsh um, economic conditions. And again, we know that the use of the cell phone is situated in their um, realities. So let's look at how they respond to this information precarity using the cell phone, given their living conditions. So as we saw from the beginning of this talk, some of you, maybe half of the, the room remembered your phones, right? And this is again where phones play an important role in navigating displacement. And I will point out that this talk is not a celebration of phones because I'll, as I'll point out in a few minutes, phones actually also put refugees at risk, uh, but it's really more a documentation of how phones are being used by refugees. And even though refugees own phones and they try to overcome information precarity using those phones, they still continue to experience that. Literature on refugees using phones points to two general areas, which is refugees use phones literally for survival and to arrive at their destinations. And refugees also use phones to try and maintain transnational ties because most families end up, most extended families end up being split with different people living in different parts, corners of the world. The new literature on ICTs focus, focuses specifically um, on phones. And again, as I mentioned at the beginning, our research looks at the intersection of phones and information. And we've identified five different areas where these two areas um, intersect and where phones are being used to overcome information precarity. 
So the first area is uh, social support. Again, because families often end up being split with um, different generations of families living in different parts of the world. So it's very common, for example, to have a situation where the parents migrated to Jordan, but the cousins are in Lebanon, um, and the grandparents are in Syria, and you have another cousin who's living in Germany. So you have families being um, spread out around the world. And as they're spread out around the world, and as they try to rebuild their lives in a country like Jordan, we know that refugees also experience a fear of building relationships with locals. Um, and there's, there's a history behind that, and there is um, rationale for that, um, including the fact that they are cognizant of the idea that they are a quote-unquote burden on society. They're cognizant of the fact that they're, um, they are draining some of the resources of the country. So they're trying sometimes to place a distance between themselves and um, between the locals. And that obviously um, will eventually have an impact on people's uh, well-being. So they adapt by using their phones to maintain those transnational ties. Refugees in Jordan who can afford some data level on their phones use their phones Usually they use WhatsApp. WhatsApp is extremely popular in the Middle East uh, to maintain those transnational ties, to send pictures back and forth between themselves and their families, um, certainly you know, to attend events virtually using their phones, events that they're missing out on. There are many examples of women who are in Jordan um, and have given birth to children in Jordan while the husband is back in Syria usually fighting with one of the um, militia groups. Um, so imagine you, ha you have literally situations where fathers have not met their children yet, and phones are used to try to establish that connection between children and uh, parents. Refugees ex um, experience information precarity because sometimes they have access to irrelevant and even dangerous information. This is particularly applicable in the context of trying to cross borders and figuring out what border on any given day is safe. Um, is the border open? Is the border closed? Um, so as you can imagine, they need access to accurate information so they can have a safe passage from the first country to the other. And they try to overcome this by, again, using their phone to verify whether the borders are open, whether today is a good day um, to, to travel, whether I should take this route versus that route, whether this smuggler, if I'm trying to get to Europe, is um, a trustworthy smuggler or, or not. So these are quotes from some of the refugees we met. Not everything is covered on television. Sometimes we only hear of it, of this information through phones. So again, the border example would be a, a prime example here. And we know that the phone and information that they get through their phone is trusted information. So I trust only this phone 100%. That's the most trusted source of information for some. We know that refugees um, experience information precarity when they can't control their image in the media or the image of other Syrians in the media. So sometimes they feel that they're being misrepresented by mainstream uh, media. And this could actually be um, quite dangerous, especially for women. So as an example that was shared with us, there were some journalists who wrote stories about prostitution being very common in camps in Jordan. And chances are there probably prostitution does exist in camps. Um, but the danger of this information is that women who are of marriage age, it puts them at risk of not being able to get married if people know that they have lived in that camp. 
So, in other words, a woman in her twi early 20s who wants to get married, if she lives in this camp where this story came out um, from, then that may jeopardize her chances of getting married in the future. So again, they adapt by using their phones to correct this information and kind of set the record straight about the conditions of their camps. And they also um, develop media literacy uh, and media strategies so that they are better prepared to work with journalists on telling their story. So again, despite loading a phone, we know that there are many technological and social limitations to using their phones. So on a very basic level, we talked about affordability and the lack of affordability of phones. We also know that depending on where they live, especially if they live in camps, they may literally not have access to a stable um, cell phone connection. So you might have to walk to certain areas in the camps where you can get better connection. You may need to switch your SIM cards and rely on a different um, service providers to get better connection depending on where you live. Um, you obviously may want to borrow your neighbor's uh, phone so you can have better connection. But also within families, usually it's the husband who owns the phone. So we know that um, there are also gender barriers to using the phone. There are certainly age barriers to using the phone. So older refugees are less connected than um, younger refugees. And finally, the threat and the fear of surveillance is always present. Syrians have um, experienced surveillance living in Syria, and some of them believe that they are still under surveillance even when they are living in camps in Jordan because the camps are very close to the Syrian border. And that puts the, that um, creates self-censorship um, mechanisms. So for example, they worry that if I say something against the regime or give too much information, then the serial cell phone gets disconnected. So they adapt by using coded language, so relying on certain codes when they are talking to each other. We've certainly heard many stories of refugees who were on the phone with family members back in Syria and those family members end, ended up being arrested when the government found out that they had relatives who have escaped the country and migrated to Jordan. So again, the use of the phone in and of itself also may put some families um, at risk. So those are the five different ways that we've identified how refugees experience information precarity and how they adapt by, they try to adapt by using cell phones. So I'm going to conclude our talk by kind of giving you quick conclusions based on the research. Again, the use of phone is situated in the socioeconomic um, realities of refugees. And the main benefit of the phone is that it helps them overcome information precarity. And I'll show you kind of an extreme example of that where communicating, communicating information is, becomes very essential. So if you can read the text and let me know if you can figure out what's going on in this message. Does anyone have any idea what's happening in this exchange, Michelle? Um, do you have text or something? Absolutely, yes. So this is, um, this is a screenshot that we took of one of um, the phones of the refugees we met. This is literally an example of a boat that capsized and the refugees in the boat fell in the water, obviously. Um, and, you know, there are reasons for that. Often the life jackets they're given are not real life jackets and the boats are um, overcrowded. And as they fell in the water, what refugees try to do is always pack a cell phone with them in a waterproof bag. And in this case, one of the gentlemen had a functioning phone and was going back and forth 
between um, who's going back and forth with an organization to try to get the Turkish or the Greek coast guard, coast guard to come and rescue the boat by sending them their exact GPS location of where the boat is. The example of this gentleman who showed us this um, the screenshot is um, he actually became a volunteer for those organizations where he now is kind of the in-between person between refugees who have whose boats have capsized and the Coast Guards. Uh, so now he acts as a volunteer between these two. So again, this is kind of an extreme example of how cell phones can um, save lives. And again, research conclusions, uh, phone ne phones never reach their full potential as a communication tool because of self-censorship, because of surveillance, because of affordability. And phones could theoretically have the potential of reducing people's exclusion from society, but at the same time, it increases their vulnerabilities, again, due to issues um, of surveillance. So kind of in summary of the research itself, there are inherent tensions in the ways uh, phones are being are owned and used and paid for, which is by the refugees themselves, and the ways that um, they may benefit other groups of people outside of the refugees. So whether it's the governments who are potentially tracking them, whether it's NGOs who work with them to help them. And again, uh, broader implications about the research. We know that there's a failure of conventional communication tools to address refugee communication needs. And we know that the burden of communication rests on the refugees themselves. So it's up to the refugees to buy a phone, own a phone, figure out how to um, use the phone and figure out how to maintain an active line on the phone. And this raises questions about the role that governments and nonprofits organizations must play in ensuring that refugees have access to accurate, relevant, timely information. So um, anyone who's interested or doing research on a similar topic, I'm happy to send you publications um, with my co-authors on this topic. If you are, if you'd like the reference list, I know this is in like font five. I'm happy to send it to anyone doing research on a similar topic. And before I conclude, just special thanks to obviously the Center for um, sponsoring this event. Uh, my previous university, who sponsored a lot of my research, and um, Marian and Jasper Whiting Foundation for sponsoring one of our research trips. Macy for sponsoring talks that we gave um, across the Northeast. And finally, many individuals who facilitated access to refugee camps and um, urban areas, starting with uh, Prince Ali's office. So I will end my talk here. Thank you for being a great audience and would love to hear your questions or comments. Thank you. I don't know, Susie, if we need to use the microphone. And no, folks prefer it, I guess. But. So, uh, what role um, do the phones play in both squashing rumors as well as spreading rumors? Because rumor research has been around for a long, long time. Since, um, there's been a lot of research done on rumor in the 1940s, 1950s, mm -hmm. long before our communication devices were available to individuals. Rumors were spreading through interpersonal communication, were causing mm -hmm. havoc, not only in uh, among people who are experiencing crises, but even people living in cities. And um, anytime you have in unstable areas, essentially, rumors end up basically causing a lot of harm. Mm -hmm. So one of the one of the quotes that you have is, "I trust this thing." Mm -hmm. This thing essentially can be both a source of rumors as well as a source of squashing mm -hmm. information for rumors. So have you dealt with that at all? So the, from the stories we've heard, so I will say, today I focused on the communication technologies. Yeah. Obviously, there, you can't, the communication technologies don't live on their own. They live with interpersonal communication. Um, so a lot of what we research is the, the coupling of, of both. The, um, from the stories we've heard, the examples that refugees shared is 
they see something on television, for example, that say this specific city was bombed on this specific date. And there's an image of a different city that was bombed. And they recognize the image because that's, uh, because that's their country, right? So they say, like, for example, there is um, a bombing in Hama, but the bombing was actually in Hada. Um, and they recognize those images. So the phones are used to correct this misinformation. It's not rumor in the traditional sense that you are thinking. Rumor in the more traditional sense, um, we've heard stories of refugees being told that, let's say, their house was, um, uh, was bombed today. But, and that's the rumor that was started, that their house today was bombed. Because a lot of refugees, when they left, they didn't sell their homes, obviously. There's no one to sell the homes to. All these properties are still in Syria. And many go back and forth between Jordan and Syria to check on their properties. Um, so they might hear a rumor that their um, property is gone, but then their neighbor might text them a picture, no, it's not gone, it's here. It's not your house, it's this other person's house that was bombed. Um, similarly, on a much more gruesome level, uh, they may hear a rumor of, let's say, a cousin being um, tortured or killed, and um, kind of their, the only way they would believe that is if they saw a picture of, um, of the body um, of, of that person. So we didn't encounter examples of how refugees start rumors, or how, um, you know, certainly not how they started rumors, but we encountered examples of how they verify whether a certain rumor is accurate or not. Yes. I think you had a question? Uh, yeah, just out of curiosity, when you, thank you, when you visited, was it very difficult to get them to open up, um, or were they very willing to give up the information? Um, so, believe it or not, surprisingly, they really wanted to share their stories. And I would say that's true of 99% of the people we met. And um, it's helped that our team had, so I spoke Arabic, my colleagues also speak, um, especially Dr. Otis Campbell, some level, of, a dialect of Arabic. They both lived in the Middle East. Um, so it wasn't hard for us to establish trust. And Syrians come from a very, very open, welcoming culture. Um, and that was kind of on full display anytime we listed um, any of the families. So um, I was super nervous about whether anyone would be interested in talking to us. And I was so surprised to learn that they were interested in talking. Thank you for your question. Thank you so much for sharing um, your research, and I think um, as, you know, kind of, I feel like Michelle's point of just, um, like, seeing about, you know, th thinking about how this research can be informative down the road in a lot of different ways, because especially since um, I just wanted to bring up from the technology angle, you bring up the link between how people are relying on um, the use of technology um, in, in a way for survival purposes, for f getting information in any way, shape, or form that they can. And um, I, I guess I wanted to, to know, um, Donna, if you could elaborate a little bit more on um, the link with how it was used to the, the term you use, psychological well-being, mm -hmm. which you had brought up mm -hmm. in your talk. And also, if the second part is if you can elaborate more on your methods, because I'm curious to what extent um, you know, in terms of gathering the data that you have gathered, um, if how, in terms of the timing, mm -hmm. if these were, um, you had followed up, you know, mm -hmm. on these particular individuals over time, or if these were just, um, at the moment, just, you know, short-term sh short experiences, and I was just wondering, down the road, if you were thinking about expanding the methods to mm -hmm. other types, whether it be, you know, I know with focus groups and interviews, if you were thinking about um, triangulating methods in other ways. Mm -hmm. Sure, yes, thank you. So I'll answer the first question. So psychological well-being, there, there's a lot of research um, from obviously the health sector that looks at the psychological well-being of refugees. Um, there are kind of unique examples of um, areas where technology and psychology overlap. For example, there's a program that I'm familiar with where um, therapists connect with refugees using technology, using Skype, to offer free consult consulting services. Um, the, 
the case of the cell phone is interesting because even though it solves some problems, it also puts a lot of um, psychological pressure on refugees, especially the ones who made it to Germany and are now under pressures from their families to help them migrate. So a refugee may have figured out a way to make it to Germany and establish you know, a somewhat normal life over there. But every refugee has 100 other family members behind them, and most of those family members are left behind. And this constant com communication between them and the families puts a lot of uh, pressure on them because now they need to recruit, they need to figure out a legal method to bring the rest of the family members uh, to, to the area they're in. In terms of methodology, we did not do longitudinal of the same individuals um, as you, I think you were um, asking. What we did, those are, the interviews are snapshots from um, all the different camps in Jordan and from multiple urban areas in Jordan and from Berlin in Germany. So there are snapshots during those specific times. Uh, but what was um, kind of enlightening is that regardless of where we were, we were coming up with very, very similar um, findings. And the, the way we tried to triangulate the information is by interviewing these different types of groups. So asking the same questions of refugees, same questions of um, what UNHCR workers were observing, observing in terms of the use of communication technologies, and what government officials were observing in terms of communication technologies. But would love to talk to you more about methods if you have ideas of how to expand this. Thank you. You mentioned that uh, sometimes the information is dangerous, what is uh, you know, shared over the phone, when the borders are open, which borders are open. How is it dangerous? It's a good thing, right? You know which border is open, so, I mean, you're, if you're... Oh, I see your point. Yes, of course. So the danger is if the information is not correct. So the danger is if, let's say, you learn that this border is open, when in fact it's closed and there are snipers on the road. The danger is if you are told the smuggler is trustworthy and you're trying to cross the border between Turkey and um, you're trying to cross between Turkey and um, Greece and you're trying to choose which smuggler to go with and that smuggler you're told is trustworthy but he's not trustworthy. So the danger is in the misinformation. Thank you for asking. Hi. Thank Hi. you. Um, are there issues with connectivity, like being disconnected, and how does that impact, like, kind of their psychological states? If, how does it work? Yeah, absolutely. So the connectivity issues, most of the issues are in Syria itself. So if you come from a region that is undergoing war right now, um, and, you know, it's under heavy bombardment, then um, you may not be able to connect to your family. You may literally not be able to connect uh, with them um, for months because there's no connection in um, Syria. So this is again where the interpersonal uh, communication plays a role. You may not be able to connect with them on the phone, but you may have someone who's coming from that specific city who can reassure you that you know your brother or, or father um, is alive. Um, so, so that's where, so there are definitely connectivity issues. In Jordan, it's more of an affordability issue with connections. Um, and in Germany, again, it's more affordability, although there are Wi-Fi spots, so it's a bit easier. There are organizations that are giving people phones, giving refugees phones? There are, uh, but the problem is these initiatives, in and of it, in a, these initiatives are controversial because of surveillance. So if a government or a nonprofit is, is, is issuing phones, refugees, for good reason, may be very um, hesitant to use that phone. So they may keep it, but they may not use it, and they may still have to purchase their own phones. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for sharing your research. My uh, question was, um, I just wanted to understand if the role of phones were also looked into how they were using it to integrate themselves into the societies they moved to in terms of finding resources and jobs and whether, like how they were doing using that, was that also uh, researched? Sure. 
So I would say in Germany, um, in Germany there's a policy of integration. And there are, so there are policies in place in Germany for refugees to learn the language and to learn the culture. Um, and there are all types of organizations that try to help you connect with locals. So one of the really neat programs we came across um, is called Start, Start with a Friend in Germany. And we met with the creators of that program. And the idea is to, once Syrians speak some level of German, they are connected with a local um, who will really help them learn more about the culture and just be their friend. And obviously that friend theoretically could have access to opportunities uh, for them. But in Germany there's a policy of integration. In Jordan, refugees um, are there really on a, even though the same is true of Germany, they're there on a temporary status and there are no policies of integration. So it's really a it, the refugee has to take it upon themselves to be with people. And the, we've heard stories of, for example, someone walking down in their neighborhood in downtown Amman and connecting, let's say, just having small talk with people on the street and finding an informal job that way, uh, such as refurbishing broken light bulbs. Um, and the person has skills in refurbishing broken light bulbs. Um, so it's more informal. But any networks you build informally, you theoretically stay in touch with using the phones. But this happens to a much, much, much lesser extent in a country like Jordan. Thank you. Are there any other questions? So to close out, um, thank you so much, Dr. Our next talk, and um, every semester we have a speaker who we invite from outside who are brought in to be part of our Dr. Melvin L. DeFleur Distinguished Lecture Series. So we are very excited. Coming up next week, Dr. Pippa Norris, um, she is the Paul F. McGuire Lecturer in Comparative Politics um, in the John F. Kennedy School of Government over at Harvard University. She'll be here um, October 23rd and it'll be from 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock over in the George Sherman um, Union's Conference Auditorium, and we have a lovely reception following the talk. Um, she will be speaking about her, uh, the role of cognitive skills in a media environment, looking at issues of trust and mistrust among government actors. So this will be actually, it's also a very timely topic um, as we enter into um, the election period. So we are ecstatic that we'll have Dr. Pippa Norris be our fall distinguished lecturer. So we hope that you'll be able to join us um, next week on her revive, arrival on October 23rd again. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Jeff. Thank you.